Hey there and welcome to Intro to Statistics with Dr. Amy Gates. This video is going to focus on an introduction to hypothesis testing and the example that we're going to look at is looking at a t-test to compare two sample means. But first to get started it's important to understand what hypothesis testing is and how it works from start to finish. So consider that most research starts with an idea. And this idea is then formalized into what we call a null and alternative or research hypothesis. Once we have a hypothesis, we can then collect samples and we can test our theory. We can use tests like the z-test or the t-test or others to determine if we're going to accept or reject our null hypothesis. So here's an example of how a hypothesis test can start out. Suppose a researcher thinks that not eating red meat will significantly lower cholesterol. This thought is an idea that is used to build a hypothesis test. Keep in mind that right now the status quo, what is normal in the U.S. and in most countries, is that people just kind of freely eat meat and they're not particularly concerned that eating meat is going to raise their cholesterol. So a researcher might suspect that eating red meat will significantly, or I'm sorry, not eating red meat will significantly lower cholesterol. So in this case, a hypothesis test would consist of a null hypothesis, which is the norm or the status quo, and an alternative or research hypothesis, which is what our research idea is trying to show. Here in this case, our research idea is trying to show that not eating red meat will significantly reduce cholesterol levels in men over 45 in the USA. And notice how specific my research idea is. Next, this idea becomes a formal null and alternative hypothesis. So our research idea was that not eating red meat will significantly reduce cholesterol levels in men over 45 in the US, but we now need to make this idea much more specific and something we can test. One of our first goals is to decide how we plan to run this test and what we're going to measure or compare. Because in hypothesis testing, you have to look at parameters and you have to be able to measure or compare them. In this case, suppose I take a sample of 30 men over the age of 45 from the USA and I separate them into two groups so that I have 15 men in each group. Then for a six month period of time, suppose I allow group one to have whatever red meat they want, but group two cannot eat any red meat. And this is for six months. So I have two sample groups of men over 45 randomly collected, 15 men in each group. Group one is no meat, but group two, I'm sorry, group one is meat okay, and group two cannot eat meat. This is what our data might look like if we put it into SPSS. Notice over here we have just numbers. This is kind of our person's D number or, or whatnot. So this is person one, person two, person three, all the way down to all 30 people. Some of our people are in group one and some of our people are in group two. So this designates the group they're in. And at the end of six months, this is their measure of cholesterol. So this is the cholesterol measure of person one who is in group one, person two who is in group one, and this measure down here is person 16 who is in group two, and so on. So this is how our data might be placed into SPSS. Next, we want to be able to compare our groups. Because the key here is we're wondering, is there going to be a significant difference between these groups? Group one can eat red meat and group two cannot. So at the end of six months, is there gonna be a significant difference between their mean cholesterol levels? So the parameter that we're comparing here is actually mean cholesterol. If we use SPSS to just calculate the mean of both of our groups, we can see visually that the group that was able to eat meat had a mean cholesterol of 255.4. And the group that was not allowed to eat meat had a mean cholesterol of 143.47. Visually, we suspect that the no meat group has a significantly lower cholesterol level. But remember, in hypothesis testing, we're taking a very small sample out of a very enormous population. 
Because we do that, we have to make sure that our differences are statistically significant. So, what are we doing so far? Our null hypothesis is generally written with the HO colon. Our alternative or research hypothesis is written with an HA colon. So what do our hypotheses look like in this case? Well, our null hypothesis, which is the status quo, is that the mean cholesterol of group 1 is going to be the same as the mean cholesterol of group 2 in a statistical sense. In other words, our null hypothesis is that it doesn't really matter whether people eat red meat or not. Overall, their cholesterol is going to be the same. Our research hypothesis, or our alternative hypothesis, is that the mean cholesterol for group 1 is actually not going to be the same as the mean cholesterol for group 2. In other words, they're going to be statistically significantly different. This not equal sign is actually a two-tailed hypothesis test. So here's our two hypotheses. And what I want you to notice is that the null hypothesis and our research hypothesis are almost exact opposites. One of them says, yep, there's not going to be a difference, and the other one says, yes, there is going to be a difference. We believe there is going to be a difference. That's why this is our research hypothesis. In the case of hypothesis testing, a test can either be two-tailed, meaning your alternative or research hypothesis has a not equal sign in it, or it can be a one-tailed test, meaning your research or alternative hypothesis has either a greater than or a less than. The null hypothesis always contains an equal sign because it represents the status quo or what is commonly believed at the time. In our example, our test is a two-tailed test because our alternative hypothesis is a not equal. We're trying to show that the group 1 meat OK is not going to be the same cholesterol as the group 2 no meat. We think it's going to be different. Alright, so let's get back to our research question. We've got our null hypothesis, we've got our alternative hypothesis. We know that our goal is to compare means of these two groups and we're trying to prove that the means are significantly different. We know that just looking at the actual mean from SPSS that we have a mean of 255.4 of group 1 and 143.47. But our question is, do we reject the null hypothesis or not? In other words, can we conclude that our research idea is significant? In order to answer this question, we actually have to run a test. Depending on the type of data you collect and the sample sizes and the information you have about your population and so on, you might run a Z-test or a T-test. There are even ANOVA tests and so on. In this case, because we're comparing two sample means from two small groups, we're going to run a t-test. In this particular t-test, and I'm going to jump ahead, if we run this in SPSS, which we can do, we're going to see that our t-value comes out as a very large number of 8.148. We also see that our significance, or our p-value, is actually zero. But what do these values mean, and what do they tell us about the conclusion of our test? In this case, and in all cases in our class, we're going to use alpha equals 0.05. What this means is that in order to reject our null hypothesis, in order to say that our research hypothesis is really significant, we want to make sure that when we run our t-test, the result of our t-test actually falls beyond two standard deviations from the mean. In other words, it falls in the critical region. When alpha is 0.05, this actually means 5% in these two tails. That's 2.5% each. Well, what does this really mean? Normally, to get these critical values, these rejection values, we would look on a table of all these numbers and try to figure out what those critical values are. But luckily, we have a couple of more straightforward options to do that. SPSS will actually calculate the p-value for us. And in SPSS, if our p-value is less than our alpha value or less than 0.05, it tells us that we can 
reject the null. Otherwise, we cannot reject the null and we cannot conclude that our research hypothesis is true. So again, when we ran SPSS, it gave us p-values. They're labeled as SIG, or significance, and they're always for two-tailed tests. Zero, which is what we're given here, is certainly less than 0.05. So in this example, we can reject the null, and we can conclude that there is significant evidence to support our research hypothesis. In other words, cholesterol is affected by the consumption of meat, according to our research and our samples. How does SPSS get the p-value or the significance? Well, it looks on a normal distribution curve or a t-distribution curve, depending on whether you're using a z-test or a t-test. And if you're using alpha is 0.05, that means that 5% of the value here of this curve is part of our rejection region. So these red arrows are pointing to the areas where we can reject the null hypothesis. In SPSS, we have a value called SIG. That's our p-value. And as long as SIG is less than 0.05, we can reject the null. If our p-value is not less than 0.05, we cannot reject the null. And that's how we make that decision. So in our example, we can reject the null hypothesis, and we are able to conclude that our research hypothesis can be supported statistically. If you want to see how you would do this by using critical regions or an actual table, there's a very fun URL or link here that will give you the critical value for any degrees of freedom and you can use that critical value to determine whether or not you're going to accept or reject your null hypothesis. In our case, again, our t-value is 8.148. When I look up the critical values in the table or using this link, the critical value is only 2.048. My t-value is much, much bigger than the critical value. So it is in the rejection region. It's all the way over to the right. And this is an image of what that looks like. Here's my little rejection regions. And here's my t-value all the way inside this rejection region. So this tells me 100% that I can reject the null hypothesis. And I can conclude that my alternative hypothesis is significant. Again, SPSS also can help you make this conclusion using the SIG result. As long as the SIG result is less than 0.05, which is your alpha value, you can reject the null. Otherwise, you can't. So finally, in conclusion, our t-test showed us that we can reject the null hypothesis, and therefore we can say that not eating meat does affect cholesterol. And if we want to see how it affects it, we can investigate both of the means to see that not eating meat actually has the lower cholesterol group. This is our first introduction to hypothesis testing, and more tutorials will come. Thanks.